Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where six, seven, eight-figure business owners and entrepreneurs come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. My favorite book of the week I just want to mention is Time Collapsing by Ed O'Keefe. He actually has several successful businesses. He has seven kids and he trains daily uh, on exercise. It's an amazing book, uh, so people can check that out. Today, I'm excited. We have Nick Ingersoll. He's co-founder and chief marketing officer of Barnana. Uh, his co-founders are Kawe and Matt. Barnana is a healthy... The reason I, you know, I found out about this, Nick, is because I actually had the product. I was eating the product. I love the product. I was like, this is amazing. What's the story behind this product? And I was eating the banana coconut and these little like squares, and essentially, and they're like nice and soft, but they're like a good texture to them. And we'll t- we'll talk about the production process. And I know you have a good uh, story about upcycling, but that's how I found out about it. And when you read their story, it's it's truly amazing. But Barnana is a healthy organic banana snack with flavors like coconut banana, which I've eaten, banana chocolate, many more. They're in over 5,000 stores, including Safeway and Whole Foods. They're in U.S., Japan, Canada, and Australia. And their company is not just a company, but they do have a mission. Their company is on a mission to end food waste at banana farms. Nick, thanks for joining me. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. There's so many good questions, and we need to talk about um, what, what, you know, how you relate to fields of sheep, cattle, and horses, which we're going to talk about too. Um, but Japan, that seems random to me, right? How do you get into Japan and Australia? So Japan is a unique story, actually. Yeah. So uh, one thing that we learned early on, myself, Kawe, and Matt, none of us have food uh, business experience, right? Like we, we weren't, um, you know, selling any sort of food products. I actually come from a tech background. So does Matt and Cowie comes from a bicycle manufacturing background. And so, um, it doesn't on paper make a lot of sense to just start slinging bananas. Um, however, uh, one thing that we learned is that we needed a lot of people around us that were in the food business to kind of help guide us along the journey. So one of the people that helped us the most, his name is Ryan Black. He's the founder of Sambazon Acai. And he had introduced us to this Japanese importer. Um, And they just had a great relationship with them. So we met them randomly at uh, an expo and just kind of hit it off from there. So it wasn't uh, sitting down and doing a SWOT analysis of, you know, market fit (laughs) and this whole whole thing. We should go to Japan, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing that, one big learning lesson actually that I've learned um, both going into Canada uh, and Japan and Australia now is that the partner is what really makes the difference. It's not necessarily the market fit, although that has to be there certainly. Yeah. Um, but it is really what is the partner going to do? Are they going to, especially in a place like Japan? I mean, a lot of people in Japan don't speak English. You're going to have to have a partner that's open to doing social media, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, yeah. um, and communicating with people, changing all the creative into Japanese and things. So, so the label is completely people. different. Like the Jap- Do you have one with you? Like, Do you have a package with you somewhere? I don't. Oh, you don't? I don't. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I tried to save mine, but I, I just finished it, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'll save the package for the interview, and I just end up throwing it out. And I, I was going to just save the package and, and open it, but I just couldn't wait, so I yeah. don't have mine on here, but... So that partner has like distribution channels and other things in Japan? Yeah, yeah. So they, they do Japanese social media, they procure events, they change yeah. all the install signage and, and distribute to retailers, yeah. Wow. So what is, do you have the same product line in Japan and U.S., or do you find that certain flavors are, you know, people respond better to in Japan? So that's a great question, and that's another thing when you're going international is to have someone, you know, our partners in Japan are Japanese, born and raised, right? Yeah. And it's important because, you know, things like peanut butter, which in America is ubiquitous with kind of like Americana and peanut butter and jelly as a kid and all right. that, um, the majority of the world doesn't really know what peanut butter is, let alone do they consume it in, in high frequency. So um, things like that don't necessarily translate into certain countries. Um, in Japan, it's... Uh, we have we have less flavors in Japan as a result. 
What are the what's the best selling flavor in Japan for you? Best selling flavor is chocolate. Chocolate. I think cho- chocolate's the universal language. Banana universal. chocolate. Yeah, I guess you could say. So then, how did you get into Australia? So Australia is a very similar sort of story. Yeah. Um, this this one was actually a little bit uh, more thought out um, as far as looking at international places that we want to go, why we would go to this place instead of this place, so the UK, Australia, um, sort of the Nordic countries. And so we found a, a partner in Australia uh, that was willing to invest a lot of money into going to trade shows and things. Um, that's kind of how that all boiled down again. Um, something that we look for, you know, if you put two – to uh, you know, competing countries on the same docket, and one you have a really, really great partner. You always go with a great partner, even yeah. if the opportunity might be a little bit larger um, in terms of revenue or volume on the other side. So, what uh, what countries you start off in the U.S. and then where do you expand from there? Which country? What was the order of the countries? It was uh, Japan first, um, and then it was Canada, then Australia. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to start off with. You know, I said, what do we want to talk about? And upcycling. You said there's a good story for upcycling. Right. What's right. upcycling? So and you know, tell me the story. Yeah. So all the bananas that we use in our products, they're all upcycled bananas. So essentially, what that means is that when you go to banana farms, uh, about 20 percent, between 10 and 20 percent of the bananas that are produced go to waste. And I so would think it's more than that. I mean, I don't remember. I put bananas on my counter, and like two days later, they're all brown. Like, how is it yeah. not more than that? But yeah, well, they harvest them when they're really green still. I see. Um, and so, in Latin America, a large portion of those bananas go to export, so they get exported to the United States and Europe primarily. Yeah. Um, and so, in the countries that we work in, specifically, about eighty percent of the organic banana production is exported. And so, the export standards are really, really high to the U.S. and Europe. They have to be a certain size. It can be mixed cuts, bruises, like all these things, right? Whereas, if you saw those bananas sitting in a pile, you'd be like, "Wow, these are." going to be really good bananas in like two or three days if I let them sit out on my counter. But they just won't make the journey to these wow. other countries. And so yeah. um, we take those bananas, uh, dehydrate them down in South America, um, and then import them to California and, and finish off the process. What were they doing with them before? Usually composting them or turning them into animal feed. Um, occasionally they'll sell them for industrial applications. Yeah. And usually they're selling them for penny, uh, pennies on the dollar, you know, when, you're, when the choice is composting them or animal feed. Um, you know, there's a, a big surplus of bananas to waste. So how do you discover to even do it this way, right? Because I think most people would then just, let's just get fresh. I mean, they wouldn't even think to get the waste bananas. They would just get, you know, just let's purchase bananas and the people would just sell them uh, the regular ones. How did you even think to, to do that? Well, it's sort of a thing that we didn't, when we first came up with the idea of Barnana and what that was, yeah. you know, we wanted to be the brand synonymous with banana-based products. And so we didn't know that there was all this banana waste going on. And, right. you know, Howie and I, we worked um, on Barnana as a side project for two years before we actually launched. And through doing that and going down to the farms, that's kind of when we discovered that there was a large portion of these bananas going to waste for essentially no reason, just because they won't make it to the U.S. in, in their fresh right. form. So um, dehydrate them down there and, and you kind of solve the problem. Yeah. And yours, I mean, they're... They're not like heavily processed, but I mean they're dehydrated. So like it doesn't matter really what it looks like on the outside for you. You're just going to be dehydrating them and forming into these, you know, squares. So yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, we're going to talk about how you started it and why you started it. And it's a really interesting way it started. But um, I I want to talk about you're the CMO, right? And you know I saw this picture. It's a gorilla uh, with a bunch of the team dressed in banana costumes. So I want to talk about some of the scrappy days and when you didn't have a big budget, marketing budget, what did you do with guerrilla marketing that worked and what just bombed? Right. So first of all, I I am the gorilla in that photo. Oh, you, you are the gorilla. Photo. I'm like, I looked for you. I'm like, I don't see a guy like an urban beardsman in this picture. Like where, where's Nick? <laughs> he had a beer all over my body in the form of a gorilla suit that day. And um, yeah, where was know, that? That, I think the one you're referring to, I mean, I've worn that suit all over the place, but I'm pretty sure that was in Kona in Hawaii for the Ironman World Championship. Mm. Uh, And so we're still super scrappy. One of our core values is think like MacGyver. And we really hold that that in everything that we do, right? And so, you know, we're dressed up in banana suits and gorilla suits and running all over the place and doing crazy shit. So um, 
you know, uh, there's been some big successes uh, mm-hmm. doing a lot of guerrilla marketing. One, one of the things when we very first started is to uh, really leverage guerrilla marketing and come up with just kind of crazy things. And so I'm always the one that comes up with the crazy yeah. ideas and then I pass it by my two partners and then, you know, it takes some convincing. But eventually, eventually it, it works out, usually. Um, I guess one of the more notable ones, right. uh, and there's actually a few. Yeah, go uh, ahead with a few. I'd love to hear them, yeah. Yeah, so I guess on the success front, um, at Expo West, so Expo West is the biggest organic natural food um, expo in the country, uh, I believe in the world, and so tons and tons of retail, you have to go there, it's it's just a place to be. And so you usually combine to this 10 by 10 booth, and you have to pay for all these programs, et cetera, et cetera, and obviously we didn't have any money, so we're not going to pay for any of these programs. So instead, what I decided to do was hire a group of professional break dancers to to dress up in banana and gorilla costumes. Wow. Um, get my whole team to then dress up in banana costumes, and we just went. As soon as the doors open, there's like this flood of just humanity where you yeah. just can't move. You know, it's like being in a line at a concert or something. It's insane. And so, um, what we did was we got a boombox, started busting out some tunes, and then just having these break dancers just start break dancing all over the place. And uh, you know, people are are taking photos, and obviously, you know, we have big signs with a hashtag that we were using. Um, and, and that proved to be very successful. Although I will say with the caveat that, um, we did almost get kicked out of the show. I was going to say, how fast did security <laughs> like get on you? <laughs> they were honest pretty fast, but we just ignored them for like a solid 20 minutes. Really? So. They just like stood by and were watching? Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, our, uh, our general mantra is, um, you know, do do push the limits as far as you possibly can without getting arrested. Yeah, okay. and it's it's not yeah. like you were disturbing like the peace or anything. You know, it's it's all yeah, good it's fun. Tough. Yeah. So tell me, so you do that, right? Sure. What kind of attention? What um, I, I don't know. Like, are people posting on social media? Are there certain people then you can go up and have that conversation? How do you use that and then use it for the relationships in the actual expo? Yeah, so I think that the expo itself, it's just, you know, you're arbitraging for attention. And yeah. there's so much clutter and so mo- so many giant booths. And, you know, if you're looking at a Cliff Bar booth or something like that, it is enormous. I mean, they're spending, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars on some of these booths. There are two or right. three tiers in the sky. And so if you're a smaller brand, I mean, you really just got to do some craziness to get some right. attention. Right, right. Um, and so a lot of the industry really does thrive on momentum and if you can get people just talking about what you're doing and that show specifically is for industry folk there's not just it's not open to the general public yeah um what you have to do is just get a groundswell of people get some buzz going on and then people are there for three days and pretty soon you just start hearing oh my god i heard about you guys doing this and that and the other um and you follow up with emails you capture all the emails with food, yeah. and you know you send them a, a recap video of people break dancing so you definitely have to integrate it throughout everything that you do but um yeah so what kind of good has come out of the expo for you so the first expo that we ever went to um i guess going back to being scrappy this is pre raising our first round of capital so um we had a sample run of the chocolate banana we bought some bananas um, from South America. So we had the original and the chocolate product, um, which the original is just banana cut up. And was there coconut add, in the original or just, just banana? Just banana. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so, you know, we didn't have money to spend. We didn't have actual packages or anything like that. So we went to FedEx Kinko's, printed out some stickers, bought some pouches on Amazon, stickered them up, made them look pretty, put them in a glass case, um, didn't give them out. And then we had, you know, bulk um, to sample with. And so once we did that, uh, we actually landed Whole Foods wow. um, in March of 2012. Uh, That's huge. We, yeah, we didn't have any actual product to fill. So as soon as we got the order, we're like, well, I guess we should probably start producing some product. <laughs> so. how, how did they decide to do – what's the decision-making process for them? Because that sounds like pretty quick. The decision-making process uh, in the entire industry is – Strange. It's it's just, it's kind of archaic. It, it's it's um, Whole Foods is is unique in that they have a decentralized buying model. So they have regional buyers who get to decide, you know, where you go in their region. Yeah. However, really, you're presenting to one person. It's not like an oligarchy, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, there's one person, depending on their personal taste, views on life, life experiences, the whole bit, 
um, they get to make the decision in, in a lot of ways. And so it really does hinge usually on one key person. Yeah. So that particular person, what do you think are the biggest factors? They're like, you know, this is amazing. My kids love bananas. I mean, what was their background that they said instantly we need to, to get this in Whole Foods? Well, I think one thing that we've always had going for us is that we're highly differentiated. So yeah. there's no banana brand other than us. There's no one branding the banana, the fruit itself. Um, and when we went and told that story to that buyer, it was really, really compelling. Yeah. Yeah. So then, okay, you make a huge sale to Whole Foods. Now what do you do? You need... Now we scramble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, let's see, March 2012, we launched officially in August in stores. Um, and so what we did was we had to go out and raise some capital because the thing you about... Did, right away. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, if you don't have personal wealth, which I certainly didn't, um, you know, you just, you don't have any money to produce a product. And if right. you want to produce product for Whole Foods and, and do it the right way, um, you know, there's going to be some inventory holding costs and, you know, some cash flow issues that you got to think through. So was that an easy pitch to an investor? Like, we have this order from Whole Foods, or is that a hard process? It was actually a pretty easy pitch, more easy than I'm willing to admit, um, just because, like I said, we're highly differentiated. The market opportunity is massive. Bananas are the number one selling fruit in the U.S. It sells more than apples and oranges combined, um, and no one has branded the banana. Kind of like Palm Wonderful did for the pomegranate, except sure. for the pomegranate is such an esoteric, you know, strange niche fruit. Um, and so, you know, the investors were excited kind of really right off the bat. And once you have a Whole Foods um, knocking at your door wanting product, it's a lot easier to raise capital as well. Yeah. So, Nick, was that the plan going in? I mean, obviously, like with a startup, you know, you have a plan and it never gets executed or never happens the way you think it happens. Was that the plan to go in there and be like, okay, let's get Whole Foods and then we'll get an investor? What was the plan up to that point? Like, what were you thinking? Well, the plan was we were going to raise capital. It was always, it, that was all your, always your plan, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, if you, if you want the rocket ship growth with a physical product like that, yeah. you're going to have to raise capital, right? Yeah. If you want to, you know, do call it a million, two million in the first year and grow two to four hundred percent year over year, it's yeah. it's tough, man. If you want to even double your business, it's, you're going to have to have some cash in the bank. So um, we were we were prepped and ready to experience the explosive growth, growth from an early stage. You know, a lot of times there's two different models, um, especially in the food business that happen. You have kind of your mom and pop, I'm going to go to the farmer's market, I'm going to make some bars in my kitchen, sell those, and eventually build it into some sort of lifestyle business, hopefully. Right. And there's the other side of the spectrum where I'm going to raise a $10 million round, Series A, and just blast it all over the place, which right. oftentimes isn't the best either. Right. Um, and we fit somewhere in the middle of that. Because yeah. So, yeah. I think I remember reading, Nick, you guys spent a long time trying to find the right partners, like distributors, suppliers. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That was I mean, a long you're... process. When you're dealing with, with people in Latin America and especially, you know, banana farmers, it's uh, it's a tough process. You have to make sure that a lot of systems are in place, a lot of QA. You know, the scariest part about being in the food business, quite frankly, is that and, and one of the most rewarding parts is that people are taking your product, they're eating it, and it's literally contributing to their life. Like, it, it is yeah. what's keeping them alive is food, right? Yeah. So it's this weird you know, unique sort of uh, experience, different than selling um, an internet-based product or software or something of, of the sort, which I used to do. Um, and so QA has always been on the top of my mind. I have to make sure that uh, all that's in place and nobody ever yeah. ever gets, you know, good. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go into the backstory because I don't want to paint the picture for people like, oh, yeah, you just um, have these things. You show up at an expo and, like, Whole Foods. Because I know you guys spent years... <laughs> putting the systems in place, at least finding the right. And you have a background in agriculture also. I mean, you said yeah. tech, but you have a background for early on in agriculture as well. Um, and so it, there was a lot that went into it up to that point, you know. Um, I want to ask about that, but first I have to ask, so those are things, some efforts that worked. And I want one more that worked, and I want what, what didn't work. And... I don't know if it's the Iron Man that you want to talk I don't know if that one worked really well, or is there another one that's a good story to tell of what your guerrilla marketing efforts 
I'm gonna I'm gonna one up the Kona gorilla okay. story. Okay. Uh, for one that worked, and then I'll give you a great one that didn't work okay. also. Um, and so this one, and this one also centers around um, the expo. And so what we and and actually kind of just around our brand in general. So what I decided to do is uh, <laughs> launch a fictitious product. Okay. Um, and this was we unveiled it in March of this year. Uh, you can go to gorillamilk.org and find out all about it. Um, like gorilla so, spelled like the animal or like the marketing? Like the animal. The animal, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, so what we did is two weeks prior to Expo West, um, I started a social media email campaign. Um, and it was that our new product unveiling, because we usually unveil a new product every year at Expo West. This year we didn't. We've been focusing on distribution and innovation. Um, I said to everyone that we're going to be producing a 100% grass-fed, fair trade, free-range gorilla milk. Milk from mother gorillas. And the <laughs> internet exploded. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, you have some people that are like, oh, this is this is too oniony to be true. Uh, you have some people that are like militant vegans that are about to burn houses down. And a lot of people that are just kind of in the what's really going on sort of stage. And so we built up a lot of momentum, um, sent a series of emails. And then the reveal at Expo West, which was on the last day, was that it was a big PSA about just because you can milk a gorilla doesn't mean that you should. And I think that being a force of change for good in the food industry, especially right now, is really important. Um, you know, it's much easier to just use pesticides. It's much easier to factory farm. It's much easier and cheaper to do all the sort of shit that's just not good for humanity. And so um, it turned into a big PSA, and at the end of the day, everybody was kind of happy and uh that, that was a good one. So what was the reaction at the end? Were people mad, like, why did you say this? Or were people just, like, laughing? What what, what was the general consensus? It was mostly laughter yeah. um, and kind of like, ah, that was a good one. Um, and then we also served a bunch of, uh, you know, vegan gorilla milk-looking um, drinks at the thing. So we had uh, <laughs> basically pina coladas for everybody uh, to enjoy at the unveiling. So was that your idea? How does this idea even come about? Like, I mean, obviously your interesting, strange mind <laughs> works in marketing ways, but was that you or how does that get flushed out? Yeah, it was me. Like I said, usually all the crazy ideas, you can pretty much bet that I came up with them and then had to really try hard to uh, <laughs> convince other yeah, people. Yeah, how did I... your co-founders let you get away with that? Was, was there a pushback on that? Yeah, so we were actually at a, a board meeting and we were talking about just innovation in general and another one of our... Um, core values is always innovate, always create. And mm -hmm. so, you know, how, there's a lot of different ways to innovate, right? You can innovate on the marketing front, you can mm -hmm. innovate in distribution channels, you can innovate with product. Um, and traditionally, we've always innovated with product every single year. This year, we weren't going to do that. And, you know, our investors are like, you know, that's okay. Um, and our investors, by the way, are industry veterans, angels, people that have been operators and entrepreneurs in the food space before. So they have just awesome feedback all the time. And so, um, you know, we're sitting there, I'm like, well, why don't we just introduce a fictitious product? And they kind of look at me, I'm like, yeah, we'll call it Gorilla Milk. Like, you know, we're milking mother gorillas. <laughs> they all just look at me. There's like a pause in the room, and they all start laughing, you know? Yeah, that can um, go one of two ways. They can kick you out, or they can all start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, um, you know, I talked to Cowie about it afterward, and I'm like, hey, man. I'm serious about this gorilla milk thing. Like, really do it. So I, I, I do all of our design at Barnett also. So I, when I designed a little mock-up package and sent it to them, and then I think that's what uh, got everybody over the hump. As soon as they saw the packaging, they're like, "Well, that's kind of cute. We should probably, we should probably." So people can something. still go to gorillamilk.org. Just still yep. up. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. So, just briefly talk about the the Kona event too. I mean, that that was really interesting, and obviously. Kawe is a triath. I mean, he was a professional triathlete, right? Yeah, he was a professional triathlete. Yeah, so it kind of goes into that. But this was at the Ironman. Yeah, this was the Ironman World Championship in Kona. And actually, to uh, parlay off of your previous question, we had a, a decent failure point um, at Kona. So there's this big bay in Kona where everybody swims. Um, and it's obviously, it's Kona, Hawaii. It's a beautiful place, all these things. And so we had bought a 20-foot-long yellow banana with our logo on it um, <laughs> from China. And we swam it out in the morning at, like, just the break of dawn. So we're swimming with this 20-foot-long inflatable banana into the ocean. And we tied a brick to it 
Um, so it ain't. This sounds like a well thought out <laughs> plan. <laughs> so everybody, everybody who's uh, training and walking around this whole area, there's just this giant banana in the middle of the bay, and everyone's just like, "What is that thing?" You know. Um, and so it was really awesome for about mm, not quite a day, and then uh, the Iron Man uh, Gestapo went out there and stole it from us. <laughs> and, popped the thing and took it away and um so it, it was a great idea but it, it didn't exactly uh execute the way that we wanted yeah. it to. a day is pretty good actually i i would think it would be get popped way earlier than that so that's that's <laughs> good yeah so what what um has not worked well that was one that didn't exactly work yeah um we, we put it out you know the, the event is like a week long really and so our idea was to have, but you want to swim out to the balloon all week, you know, um, and it lasted eight, ten hours, and it yeah. was gone. So um, that was a decent failure. Yeah, it was a decent one. Any other interesting ones to talk about? Well, yeah, I mean, keeping with the Iron Man theme, actually, it's the same Iron Man. Uh, there's a thing called the Undie Run, and so. Uh, the photo that you saw actually was right after the undie run. I had a GoPro strapped me in this whole thing. And what I decided to do was put underwear on the gorilla suit and then run around in the gorilla suit amongst all these other people, you know, doing the undie run. And um, there's this big sort of uh, gathering before the undie run. And the, the promoter. Like, are, are people to... actually in their underpants or what's. Oh, yeah. Everyone's just in their underpants for this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, well, triathletes, they're usually running around in Speedos anyway. So right. For them, you know. Um, so I, show, I show up in the gorilla costume, we have a bunch of people in banana suits, and there's, I don't know how many thousands of people in this gathering, and you have the promoter, the promoter of Iron Man on stage, and he just calls all of us out and starts this chant, take off the suits, take off the suits, <laughs> and uh, it turned into a complete and total shit show. Um, we didn't take off the suits, but uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was an intense moment. So you have the whole crowd turned against you? Totally. <laughs> you know, Nick, what's interesting is I want to get into some of the background story because it's, you know, you're a fun fact about you that most people wouldn't know is you um, love and go bow hunting. Um, and you used to work as a ranch hand. So, yeah. what did you do as a ranch hand? What, what's your so job? My official job as a ranch hand was to essentially. Um, restrain the cattle uh, in the summers, usually, and they would come and brand them. Give my so, to talk about restraining. I mean, this is not like you have them on a well, leash. Like, what are you sure. doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, nobody's uh, putting them in sweaters and walking them on a leash, that's for sure. Um, so essentially the way that it works, you have the owners of the farm, usually, uh, you know, a couple cowboys. They're on their horses. There's a giant, you know, maybe 500 head of cattle. Um, sometimes a thousand, depending on, on how big the farm was. And so they would uh, essentially take the cattle one by one, chase them through a little gate. And then at the end of the gate, there was me and one other person. And then we would uh, run next to the cattle, grab them, and tackle them on the ground and hold them uh, in a headlock or a leg lock uh, while they come and, and get branded. Well, we yeah. have to put the disclaimer, no animals were harmed when you, when you had them in a headlock. So yeah. Yeah, I didn't choke him out unconscious. Yeah, if you so do you do like if you could wrestle a cow and hold up the headlock, do you do like jujitsu or any of these other you do? Yeah, I do jujitsu. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you train. Maybe that's how Conor McGregor should train. You should tell him if you're <laughs> a ranch hand for like a summer. <laughs> <laughs> we got a fight coming up with Nate Diaz this weekend, so <laughs> um, get Barnan in his hands, be like, you know, you could be i I'll tell you how I trained. Um <laughs> So tell me about growing up um, in Nebraska. Yeah. So what was it like? For a lot of people, um, you know, I would imagine the majority of people who listen to the show are going to be people who either grew up in a suburb or in a city. Um, you know, most of the people that I know did. And so uh, I grew up out in the country on a dirt road. You know, we, there was a sheep pen across the dirt road mm -hmm. from us. And so, you know, me as a child, just running around in the country just doing basically whatever you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we'd, we'd go and, and, and shave sheep and, you know, and wrestle cattle and, and the whole bit. So, you know, it's a def it's definitely a, a much, much different place. You know, in a lot of ways, it's still stuck in the old west 
Um, there's still a lot of like covered wagons along the Oregon Trail and really? pioneer graves and um, wow. and that's sort of a you know a metaphor for the whole area and the way that the economy and society works there. It's it's very slow and uh, much different than uh, where I live now. So what did your parents do when you were growing up? So my dad, he actually worked for the city. I grew up in uh, sort of a blue collar household. Um, he was disabled at a relatively young age. Really? Uh, yeah. So he essentially raised my brother and I, um, and my mom was a nurse. So, you know, what did you want to be when you grew up early on? Well, my earliest recollection was to be a firefighter, right. and the reason is because my dad was a volunteer. There's no paid firefighters, FYI, in Nebraska. There's just not a lot of uh, people and or people to start fires in that general Everyone area. volunteers, yeah. Everyone volunteers, yeah. So firefighting was always like this really cool, you know, sort of thing and um, a very a very boyish um, dream, right, is to be a firefighter. Um, but er- early on, I realized that one of the more important things to me is to not have to struggle, to not have to look for my next paycheck and I have to switch jobs and figure shit out. And, you know, we had some tough times growing up and, um, you know, as I grew up, it was like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to have to make this life work for myself and not have to rely on yeah. anybody else. And so once I got that thought in my head, um, you know, that was my earliest thoughts of entrepreneurship and, and yeah. working for yourself and doing the whole thing. So, um, it's been that way for a long time. So were you in high school when you were thinking like that or at what point? Yeah. About eighth grade, yeah, eighth middle grade. school. So then, what did you do growing up? Because you did some entrepreneurship, like uh, businesses, activities, right? Oh yeah, I did all kinds of weird things. Um, I used to. Uh, so gum was essentially banned in middle school, so I started a little gum stand outside the school for a while. Sold some gum that was relatively profitable for like a you know eleven twelve year old kid. Um, so that that worked out pretty well. Everyone was like addicted to gum. I swear, it killed them. Um, Let's see, what else did I do? I mean, I sold a lot of stuff um, at garage sales. I would go and I would buy a bunch of cards and coins and things like that at garage sales, and I would go to this cards and coin store um, down in the nearest town, and I would sell it there and try and make money. I'd always been a saver, so I'd always, I'd never really spend the money. I always just yeah. keep it, you know, in this little envelope. Um, and then eventually I started producing a lot of fine art, and so I do a lot of mixed media, mm. a lot of paintings. And I would show them the galleries and sell them and kind of build my name in the Midwest. That's as, cool. Uh, so, yeah. Where do you think you got that from? Because I can imagine people in your hometown, I don't know, but do people just like they want to stay there, right? It's comfortable for them. Is that typically the mentality? Like I'm going to stay here, stay in the town and do whatever, whatever that entails? Totally. I so mean, there's, there's... you thought differently from everyone else. Why? good question. I mean, I think that, you know, from a young age, I didn't grow up in the town itself. I kind of grew up in the country on, you know, an island away from, um, you know, I couldn't just go to a a grocery store or something like that. Yeah. What does Uh, that look like? What do you mean? So what did you do for food? Like you couldn't just go to a grocery store. What does that look like when you want milk or whatever? Well, I mean, my parents would eventually, you know, eventually go there and buy groceries for the week or two weeks or something like that. Um, but I couldn't just go get a Mountain Dew real quick, you know, and we weren't allowed. You well, know, that's what I mean. Out. Yeah. We, yeah. We didn't have any video games or anything like that. So you know, it was a lot of drinking water and playing around in the fields and building forts and, um, you know, taking care of the sheep and, and things like that growing up. So fast forward to college for a second. So how do you meet your co-founders? Right. So I, uh, I decided to leave Nebraska, um, as soon as I graduated high school, I, I actually concocted this plan about the same time, maybe 13 years oldish, that I'm going to go out to California and go to college. Like, that was the whole thing. Really? Uh, my parents were very against, which everyone along the way was like, don't do that. You know, um, people in Nebraska tend to have a very small town mindset um, in western Nebraska, to be, to be clear. And so, um, went to college. I was part of a lot of different organizations, one of which was the American Marketing Association. Yeah. And that's when I met Poway. Um, at the time, I was doing a lot of design and marketing consulting. So, yeah. you know, I designed logos and branding and helped them out with their SEO strategies and, yeah. and whatnot. Was and this so, part of like Candy Lab or is that after? That was right before. Okay. So, Cal and I actually worked on Barnett as a side project while I was running Candy Lab um, for two years. And so, I met Cal. He had a bicycle manufacturing company at the time. So, I was trying to pick up a client. He was trying to find people um, that wanted to intern. And then we started talking about this Barnana thing. Um, started working on it as a side project, like I said, shortly after I co-founded Candy Lab. 
Um, and then, you know, Barnett actually came to fruition in stores about two and a half, three years later. So those early conversations, Nick, about Barnett. Yeah. And that was because of Coway's dad? Yeah, exactly. So Coway grew up in Brazil, and these dried, these dehydrated banana snacks have been in Brazil for a long time. And I like to, um, you know, make an analogy to coconut water or acai. So coconut water, acai, they've been in Brazil for like 40, 50 years. Right. That's normal to them. It's normal, yeah, and it really broke out into the American market relatively recently. So, you know, in the mid 2000s, you saw coconut water come to the U.S. and kill it, Zico and uh, Vita Coco, and you know the whole bit. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this product was in Brazil. His dad used to make them um, in the backyard. You know, dehydrate these bananas, and um, you know, Cow is like, these bananas are in Brazil. There's coconut water coming here. You know, there's acai coming here. Mm-hmm. I think that this could be the next thing. And we started looking into it and finding out how popular bananas are relative to coconuts and relative, right. certainly relative to acai, which there was no market for it. Um, it just started to make a lot of sense. So what do you do first? So he, you guys have a discussion. He's doing his thing with the bike manufacturing. You're doing your thing with the candy lab. Yep. What do you do to start this process of, oh, like, you know, you say you start working on the side. What does on the side look like at that point? Yeah, so on the side, what that looked like, we would go to what was his roommate's office um, at the time. And so his roommate had this nice office uh, technology startup company. And we would kind of um, go into the corner on this little table and, and work on Barnana things about three times a week. Um, and so we started out with the branding. I think that one of the most important things, especially early on, is to build something that looks legit, whether you have a product or not. Yeah. Um, build a brand that looks really, really believable for a lot of different reasons, both yeah. from you know consumers and investors, et cetera. And then how yeah, we started going to South America, trying to find banana farming partners, obviously as all of his family in Brazil. So we started looking in Brazil first. We decided Brazil is probably not the best country right now. It's one of the BRIC countries. There's a lot of volatility. Um, so we started looking in, in other countries near Brazil. Um, and then we were trying to find packaging. And like I said, we were brand new to the game. So there was a lot of learning lessons. Started cold calling people off of LinkedIn, looking for advice and you know yeah. building an advisory board. So um, there was a lot of front work for sure. What was the original, Nick, what was the original vision of the product itself? Because I can imagine, did you? what were the first iterations of it? Because I can imagine it doesn't look or probably feel or taste like it does now. Because like, I mean, if people can picture, I wish I, I saved some, but I ate them all. You know, they're like little cubes. Right, they're kind of dark, yeah. and whether this the one I had with coconut, so it's got coconut shreds and whole banana in it. What did what was the initial product? What did it look like? Yeah, so we have right now we have two different product lines essentially mm-hmm. in in one. So three of the products are coated, so it's a banana center coated in chocolate or coffee coating or peanut butter. Gotcha. And then the other three are like the coconut, so they're just they're kind all of mixed together. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so originally we launched with original and chocolate. And we weren't exactly sure if we wanted to do it in a bar format, you know, your traditional flip right. bar format, um, in a pouch. We didn't know if we wanted to do, you know, a banana brownie sort of deal where it's kind of like a bar, but we market it as a brownie. It was really up in the air because in right. Brazil, the way that it's typically sold is that you just have these dehydrated banana fingers and they're really, really sticky and they're just wrapped up in cellophane and sold on street carts and corner marts and things like that. Right. So, um, you know, we knew we had to make it look and feel different for the American consumer, make it more convenient. Um, so we decided to cut it up. We actually cover the original in banana flour um, so that it doesn't stick to your fingers because that was a big problem mm. when we were testing it. And so, um, you know, it definitely went through a lot of iterations. Uh, but the original product that you would see previous to us uh, messing with it, um, it, it's it's not that easy to eat. Yeah, so why did you decide on the cubes as opposed to the bars or the brownies or anything like that? Yeah, so when we started doing the market research and, and going into it, you look at the bar set, and it definitely is one of the most you know high traffic areas of the store, but it's also the most cluttered, Pretty the most competitive. competitive. Yeah. Very hard to differentiate yourself, and when you look at the space on the shelf, I mean, you get about this much space for your branding to shine through, yeah. and that's tough, man. Um, and so we decided to launch with pouches instead. So from a producing manufacturing, is it any easier or hard to do what you're doing as opposed to the bar? Because I can imagine, I would think it'd be harder personally. Because now you have these, all these little cubes, you got to get them in a pouch as opposed to just a bar. I don't know. 
Yeah, you're 100% correct. It is much more difficult to do the pouch with our product specifically. Um, it's semi-automated. There's still some manual components to it, especially with the cubed product like you had. Um, you know, manufacturing, is it's not the easiest thing, especially because bananas, it gets really dense because we take the water out of them um, and really, really sticky. So machines get gummed up. Uh, you know, there's definitely some struggles on that front. So what's been the biggest challenge from the manufacturing side of things? I think the biggest challenge is making sure that we make the uncoated items like the coconut, um, the apple cinnamon specifically, easy to cut, mm -hmm. um, finding the right machinery, and automating the process. So right now, like I said, there's still a manual component to uh, the uncoated items that you know we're just experiencing higher costs than we should. Um, and you know it's it's an ongoing challenge getting the right ingredient makeup you know the ratio of coconut to banana and how that affects the machine um, getting different machines trying new ones you know you never quite know how well the machine will work once you get it um, talking to different co-packers and seeing what they suggest so um, right now that's probably the biggest challenge so the coding is actually easier yeah oh wow yeah okay I wouldn't have guessed that yeah it's, it's the coding is easier um, you know one of the challenges with the coating, of course, is the bananas are so damn sticky that uh, you have to break them up so that they get, um, you know, coated one by one instead of in globs. Uh, so that can be a challenge, I too. I see. But yeah, so also. they're not all sticking together once the chocolate melts or something like that, or uh, hardens or something like that. Um, because you do all this, and then you bring it in here to package, right? You bring it into the U.S. to package? So we dehydrate the bananas in Latin America. And then we import them, and we do everything else. In, in oh, you do power. everything else there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. That's amazing. So how long are you working on to the side until you drop the other project, your other business? Because so, that's, a, that's a hard decision, right? It was tough, man. Um, you know, it was damn near three years, <clears throat> two, two and a half years, something like that. Um, you know, le leaving one baby and starting a new one, is uh, always a tough thing. I mean, I still serve as uh, an advisory. Uh, I have an advisory role with Candy Lab, and um, they're doing a lot of great things. What does um, Candy Lab do? For, branding and creativity stuff? Yeah, so we started as a branding house and an SEO firm, and then we moved into augmented reality. So really? right now we have an augmented reality platform, kind of like Pokemon Go, which is Possibly the best thing ever to happen to Candy Lab because now people know what augmented reality is. Right. Um, and so Candy Lab essentially builds white label um, apps for businesses uh, in the augmented reality space. Wow. Yeah. So how do you decide this is now the right time to work on Barnana full time? Um, it was a, it was a complicated set of circumstances. You know, um, there's a lot of interpersonal things that happen. There's a lot of you know, different sorts of struggles and things pulling you different ways. For me, I wanted to be involved in a physical product that made a difference in people's lives. Um, and so that's what I decided to do, ultimately. When did the third co-founder come into play with Matt? Matt came on, right? Yeah, yeah. So Matt came on um, early stage, when, right before we launched as well. Um, he actually worked for Cowie's roommate, whose office that we were using for like two years mm. on the side. So he had kind of seen it. He was, you know, uh, very interested in the brand the whole way through. Um, and so he came on, yeah, before we launched also. So how do you come up with the name? So Barnana. Um, we like to say that the banana is nature's original energy bar. Yeah. It comes in its own package. Uh. It's already the shape of a bar. The only problem is, is the packaging sucks. It goes bad in like three days. Um, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, Barnana. So that was an easy decision. Yeah. Wow. Nice work and, with that. And the interplay between the R and the N, um, with the logo kind of, kind of helps. So Nick, I wanted you to talk about the products because obviously the more lines you release, it's, it's harder. Um, you have more product. What was the first product? And then how do you decide and when do you decide to release the next one, next flavor? So that's always a tough question. Yeah. It, it really is. And especially at this stage, it's even more difficult. Um, at the beginning, you know, you don't want to be a one-trick pony. Um, and so just having two SKUs, it's, it's not enough to say yeah. that you're the brand synonymous with banana-based products, right? It's just not. Yeah. Um, so the next year, we knew we had to innovate and launch two new products. 
Um, the year after that, we knew we had to innovate and launch two more. So we have six flavors in two different sizes, 12 SKUs total now. Um, and in uh, March of next year, we're going to be releasing a new product line that's actually different from the Chewy Bites, mm. uh, which is really exciting. But, you know, early on, we knew we had to innovate. We have to stay relevant. And to be the brand synonymous with Banana, yeah. it's going to take uh, a lot of products to do that. So we, we planned early on. Yeah, I'm curious because it, it could apply to anything. It doesn't have to be physical or even edible, but for even, you know, um, a tech startup, you know, releasing a different product or feature set or whatever the case is. So what was the first, second, third product? I want to hear, like, how you decide what the next flavor is. Yeah. So we did some consumer research. So we sent out surveys, kind of saw what people liked, what they didn't like. We did that whole thing. Um, we looked at what was currently available in the set that we sold in. So, you know, where are we at in the store? Who do we sit next to? What do they have? What don't they have? And where are the holes at? Um, that's where we started. And then once we do that, we make a bunch of different prototypes, um, actual physical edible prototypes, yeah. test them out, see how they taste. Because in concept, it may sound really awesome, right? And then in, in practicality, it's like, well, that's not exactly what we were going for right. or, you know, some, something like that. So I think that one of the most important things before launching a new product is to really make sure that the current products that you have are selling well and doing what you want them to do. Because what you don't want to have happen is all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, eight products and two of them sell well and the rest are kicking rocks. And pretty soon you're going to have to start discontinuing things and, um, you, that's not a good look. You don't want to do that. So the first product was just the straight banana product? Yeah, we launched with, banana, with the original and uh, the chocolate. And the chocolate. And so what was the next one after the chocolate? The uh, coconut and peanut butter. So tell me about the coconut one. Yeah. Is that from customer feedback? Is it from personal preference of the team or both? How do you how do you decide on and coconut? Well, coconut's a very polarizing flavor to begin with. So some people really love coconut, right. and some people just hate it for whatever reason. Um, and so for us, it that's what the data showed, too. When, when we did all the surveys, some people rated it as their most favorite and their least favorite, and there wasn't a lot of in-betweens. Um, but it did rank really, really high. It ranked actually number one as far as all the new flavors that we wanted to introduce. Really? Peanut butter was second. And then once we made the product, it tasted really good. The texture was really nice. And so, uh, you know, the flavor combinations, it's a tricky thing. So, you know, you have banana and coconut. But if you take banana and pineapple, it just, for whatever reason, it just doesn't, it doesn't mix taste well good either. together. Yeah. It tastes great. Pineapples taste great. You put them together and it just doesn't quite work out. So um, getting that getting that combination is, is crucial and, and tough to do. Which is your personal favorite? Personal favorite is definitely the apple cinnamon. Apple cinnamon, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. But I'm a sucker for cinnamon, so I'm biased. Got it. All right. I'm gonna have to try the other flavors because the I've tried I've had the organic coconut, um, coconut banana a few times. But I'll have to I'll have to branch out a little bit. Um, so. You're gonna talk about some of the milestones of the business and when. So you guys are essentially early on bootstrapping it, doing all the the hard work, the background research. When do you hire your first team member and, and who do you decide to hire? Right. So our first team member that we decided to hire, it was actually it was a little weird how we got to it. So we started out by That's building That's what I like about it, yeah. Yeah, we started by building an advisory board. So um, they weren't paid people, right? Um, and that helped us a lot. That helped us delay hiring people with knowledge, right? Um, and then once we did that, we had some success on the East Coast um, with Wegmans is another big retailer out there. Mm -hmm. and so we knew we needed somebody to manage that out there. We ended up hooking up with a New York City distributor. And in New York, you pretty much have to go with a DSD if you want to be successful in all the bodegas and small markets. Um, it's a very, very different place in the rest of the country or any other city for that matter. Yeah. Um, and so we knew, we knew we had to do that. And with working with a distributor, one of their caveats was that we needed to have a full-time person in New York City catering to all those accounts. Mm. And so, um, you know, that combined with Wegmans, it just made a lot of sense to have somebody on the East Coast because we can kill it in our backyard. We can go to all the stores, and we did. You're local. Uh, all yeah. the stores we went into did really well. But on the East Coast, you know, we're not going to be flying to New York and Pennsylvania every yeah. uh, third Sunday of the month or something. So we knew we had to have somebody out there to grow the business. So who, how do you hire someone? Who do you hire for that? 
Yeah, so we started interviewing some people. Um, we actually found someone that uh, went to San Diego State, which is my alma mater, and right. uh, Matt, my uh, the other co-founder. And so um, it was actually just through networking. It was just through you know people of people putting the wreck out there and, and seeing who flew in. She was actually a broker in the natural food space, so she kind of knew what was going on um, all over the country, and so it, it worked out. So I love your approach with the advisory board. That's so smart. And how do you attract a high-level advisory board and then tell them they're not going to be paid? <laughs> well, that's always the funny part um, because <laughs> a lot of people... Um, so everyone else can do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, it's, it, you know, I would recommend to anybody, you know, building an advisory board for me has been one of the most important things that we did early stage by yeah. far. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're going into a, a genre of business that you just don't quite understand all the... Yeah. Even if you do, it's like you don't know everything and those people are going to be above you and know way more than you do. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So um, we reached out to a few. We did a lot of networking. I'd show up to events, create just personal relationships, ask them a million questions, um, you know, take them out for drinks or dinner or whatever. Um, and then eventually... Um, ask them if you know they just want to be a, an informal advisor of sorts. Yeah. Uh, and so you know we ended up getting a, a solid amount of people on on the advisory board, and that really did help us early on. One of the guys, uh, his name is Jeff Grad, and he's the co-founder of Evolution Fresh Juices. And you know, still today, he's a great friend, and um, he's always just been a good dude that's that's willing to help out. And I think in certain industries, it's going to be easier to find than others. I think in tech, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, than it will be with natural foods, but um, those people are out there. You know, Why do you I, think? I just think that in the natural food space, it hasn't been uh, bastardized quite yet. Um, people are more open, you think? I think they're a little more laid back, a little more willing to help. It's, it's more community-focused um, than tech, in my experience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, you know, I sit on a couple of advisory boards, too, and it's, you know, I don't expect to get paid or anything. I, I'm just wanting to help people that are doing good things. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's good to find people like that. So Nick, what's some of the best advice you got, uh, from the advisory board or from one of the advisors? Mm, the best advice, best advice is a tough one. I think that one or the of evolution the, fresh juices, like what, what good advice did he, you know, give you or help you guide you on that really saved you a lot of time, energy, or money. Yeah, I think that he really kind of struck home um, what it means to be a natural brand, what it means to be organic, what it means to stick true to those values. He yeah. also co-founded Naked Juice. Um, he co-founded Naked Juice? Naked Juice, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's huge. Massive. And, um, you know, what he saw from, from that is that and he had a lot of great learning lessons from that. So they started in San Diego just literally selling juice out of their friggin' van or whatever, out right. of a cooler. And they had no shelf life. And then they had to scramble to, you know, make the shelf life longer to get into retailers. Right. They ended up selling the product. And now the product is something completely different than what they started with. Right. Um, and so, you know, sticking true to the, the core values of your business is something that I learned from Jeff in, in a real meaningful way. Yeah. He's probably seen a lot of the the ups and downs, I would assume. Totally. And he's a real dude, too, you know, and that's one thing that you find in business a lot of people fronting or a lot of people putting on a certain sort of mask to talk to you, um, and Jeff is uh, about as real as they get, so, you know, I, I like those types of people. How did you meet him? Um, we met him through a program in San Diego called Connect, um, and so that's essentially a, a program that takes San Diego startups and tries to help them out in some way, shape, or form. Hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. I want to know what you consider another milestone. So, you know, the first hire, what all the other milestones you consider really that help propel the business? Yeah, I mean, definitely our, our first round of investment was huge. Um, you know, our first employee, uh, our first round of interns, for sure, <laughs> which was uh, really fun. Um, Whole Foods Market was a massive one. Uh, we've raised a few different rounds of capital, so those always tend to be uh, milestones. And then also um, getting into key accounts. So we're in Target right now in Los wow. Angeles. That's amazing. Um, and we're doing really well there. So we'll probably be going nationwide next year. Um, there's also a very uh, popular copy chain that we will likely be getting plussed out to nationally next year. Um, those are just some of the current milestones that are, that are coming to wow. mind. But, um, 
those are going to be big ones for sure. So talk about navigating financing, right? Because before I think you, the candy bar was was bootstrapped, right? The star, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole other animal. So what was difficult about that process that people should know about when they're considering raising capital? A few things. I mean, um, luckily, I was relatively well-versed in startup finance, and then uh, Matt did startup finance for his previous company, so okay. he's really good at it. Um, and so I think the most important thing is the concept of valuation. Um Valuation, especially when you're raising your first seed round or Series A or whatever you want to call it, it's really just, you know, the number is flexible. It's not this set thing. There's no formula. There's no algorithm you can plug it into and tell you what the answer is. It's this is what I think I'm worth. This is why. This is who we have on our advisory board. This, these are the co-founders that we have to make the shit happen. And, you know, some investors may come by and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'd love to invest in your company, but uh, I want to... I want a different valuation. You should lower your valuation to whatever. Of course they're going to say that. <laughs> of course they're going to say that, right? And so yeah. it's it's all about sticking to your guns, man. It's having a, a good idea in your head, not raising too much too fast, not raising money from the wrong people. If you get the wrong people involved, it's going to be a world of shit, and you really don't want to find yourself um, in that situation at all. Um, and as soon as you take money from someone um, that doesn't have your best interests in mind, they're, you're, you're in a marriage at that point. You know, you're know, you tied in. So um, take the money from the right people. Uh, don't raise too much too fast. And really think the financing strategy out one, two, three years in advance. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Nick, if you're not allowed to answer this, that's, that's cool. I'm wondering the, um, the most you raised in a round before and then what you did with it. So our current round that we're raising is the largest round. Um, uh, it's an undisclosed amount, so I, I can't disclose that, unfortunately. Um, what we're doing with it, we're using it to plus out distribution in a large way and also ramp up consumer marketing. So you use it for just more product? Yeah, definitely. So you know, when you're going into, call it Kroger, or any chain that has 2,000, 3,000 uh, stores, there's a lot of slotting fees associated with it. You have, to, you have to market a lot. You have to do a lot of ads. You have to send people in there, bodies in the store, to demo the product, to make sure it gets off the shelves, to educate people on what's going on. Uh, going into new retailers is very expensive and capital intensive. Um, so, you know, in 2017, there's going to be some big wins and big dominoes to fall, and uh, we have to be well capitalized to do that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure, like, strategically, you pick the right people investing who are you know, have industry knowledge and everything like that. And I think I read an article, there's two people that – uh, you feel like give really good advice to the company. Um, it was Pat Finn and Scott Cohen. Yeah. What What did they tell you? Yeah, I mean, you know, Pat Finn, uh, Scott Cohen, all the guys at Boulder Food Group, um, Mark Rampola, all these guys. Mark Rampola is a uh, founder of Zico Coconut Water. Yeah. I just um, someone just told me to read his book yesterday. It's a great book, man. It's really good. Yeah. It is really good. It's. Um, I, I just got done reading it, and I won't give any spoilers out, but uh, yeah. it's a great book. I recommend it. And Mark's a great guy. He's giving us great advice. This is like Pat. he wrote High Hanging Fruit. High Hanging Fruit? Is that what it was called? Yeah. Which is perfect for a banana company. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah, those guys, I mean, they just have great advice, man. It's it's crazy, you know, whether it's um, looking at the P&L and giving us advice there, whether it's... Um, you know, working with certain retailers, learning lessons from their previous companies. Yeah. You know, we have uh, Tom was the founder of Evolve Burritos, and Dayton who was the founder of Function Beverages, and um, you know Jerry Bello, he was the founder of Mama Says Pasta Chips, etc. You know, we really did get a great team of uh, investors. Yeah. That's that amazing. Have yeah, actual operational experience which is rare. Yeah. So what did Mark tell you? Did he give you direct advice on the company? <laughs> yeah, they they all have tons of advice. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, one of the things that, that Mark told me is that, you know, you shouldn't overinvest in things that don't work just because you've committed to doing those things, which is mm. kind of the whole commitment of ex escalation sort of paradigm that a lot of people find themselves in and to be wary of that. And, um, you, know, you can see in the book, uh, several times where, you know, things get tough and then what do you do? And you have to scramble and, you know, a lot of supplier relationships and making sure you don't consolidate supply. Um, for him, it was coconuts for us, it's bananas into one central area. Cause then you're going to have 
to figure some shit out if they get bought by your competitor, let's say, or a, or a different strategic. So that's true. Um, yeah, there's a lot of gems in there. Yeah, and so it's, it's funny because reading through the book, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what he was telling us. Was he giving that advice advice in general, or was there a specific point he was trying to make about one of your products? Like, I know you worked hard on this one, Nick, but get rid of it. <laughs> No, I think it was just in general, you know, for us, we, you know, kind of batter these guys with tons of questions all the time. Um, and so, you know, usually uh, they come up with some pretty pretty unique and, and awesome answers. Yeah. So, Nick, what um, what software do you use to run the company? Because you have Man, a lot of moving parts. And you're a software, tech guy, too. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. In, the food, in the food space, it's kind of archaic. It's still like 1920s Prohibition era you know, people are still using like faxes and, you know, the printers that have like the two little tabs you rip on the sides and the whole thing. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Um, so we use a ton of a ton of technology. So the ones I can't live without, personal productivity, of course, uh, Wonderlist, Evernote, uh, I use Boomerang, Gmail offline, a lot of tools to just make sure I manage my time more efficiently. Yeah. Um, Schedule One, I love using Schedule One. Um, we also use Unleashed for our back-end inventory software, um, Zero for our accounting, Box.com, TopDesk, Help Scout. Um, you know, we've just built a ton of systems because we want to make sure that we don't get caught with our pants down. Um, you know, you have to plan for growth in advance and um, make sure those systems are in place before you actually need them. And then what about like shopping cart stuff for your website and things like that? Totally. So we built, uh, I built the site on Shopify mm -hmm. as the back end. Um, looks I do it looks beautiful. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I enjoy designing it. I, I like Shopify as a back end. Um, it's much easier than Magento, which of course, you know, it's, comes with its own host of craziness. Um, the other great thing about Shopify is their app platform. So they have a ton of just plug and play apps. You don't have yeah. to spend a lot to, you know, try something out in development. So, um, you know, we use Clavio for our email marketing. Mm. Uh, used to use MailChimp. MailChimp now has some automation functionality, but I think Clavio, if you're using Shopify. I've heard Clavio is like really the best for e-commerce people to use. Yeah, I agree. So what, any apps you love on Shopify? Yeah, I like the one of one of the ones that come to mind are the Recharge app. So that's a subscription app, um, and a surprising amount of people want bananas every single month or every 15 days for that matter. So they subscribe, um, which of course is nice because then you don't have to uh, deal with you know ebbs and flows of revenue and, and follow up and all that. So um, Recharge is a great one. Product reviews is great, you know, for SEO and other purposes. Um, I have a laundry list of apps installed. Olark, Live Chat has been a big one. Mm. Um, the Free Shipping Bar, which is actually a free app, is a really, really nice one to have. Um, yeah, I could go. I could go on all day. I, I love hearing like. about it. I love <laughs> hearing this stuff. Um, how hard is it? I mean, you guys have a lot of serious logos for the the banana uh, snacks, like. Your USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, paleo. How? I mean, it's got to be. It's not an easy process to get certified organic, right? I mean, talk about that. That's a conscious choice. You don't have to do all of those things for the product. Totally. Um, especially being organic. That's we're never going to create a product that isn't organic. Um, going back to my childhood, you know, personally, the reason that I believe it's the correct thing to do is. Um, you know, growing up in the country, there's a lot of corn fields and wheat fields and such. And when I was a little kid, I remember looking up and there's these planes flying and just, and, uh, you know, all over the place. And I, I thought they were watering the fields because I'm like, you know, six or seven or whatever. Right. And my dad came out in the morning. I'm like, dad, look at all the planes. You know, they're watering the fields. He's like, oh, that's not water. That's pesticides. And, you know, where I grew up, the water table is very close to the ground. You know, it's, it's all um, groundwater. Yeah. And so, you know, there's been a lot of just uh, speculation of, as far as pesticides kind of poisoning the water. Diseases and, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, the more you contribute to conventional farming, the more you contribute to the use of pesticides, and uh, it's just tough for me. Um, so we are certified organic. It's a tough certification to get. It is a massive process. Yeah. Um, I manage our organic certificate, so I'm intimately aware of all the details of it. It's, yeah. it's a beast. It really is a beast. Um, non-GMO project, um, you know, we have 
you, you, you know, you, you called them all out before, but, um, yeah, yeah gluten free kosher. Is that a kosher? Yeah. So you have a rabbi go out to, uh, the fields of, how does that work? yeah, <laughs> just, it's, it's a network of rabbis. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. No, I know that each one of those signifies a lot of time and energy and work, you know, and it's a conscious choice to even, cause it's costly for you guys to do that. Um, so, you know, we talk about the software, we talk about some of the systems, what, anything else we missed with the milestones that you're really proud of? Um, you know, uh, it's funny to say for me, it's really hard to celebrate milestones. Um, each time we do something good, it's just kind of like, all right, great. What's next? Oh, I'm thinking of the next thing. Yeah. And so kind of looking back and, and celebrating the wins, um, I guess historically I'm just not very good at doing that, uh, for better or for worse. We definitely had some good milestones. You know, Safeway was a great milestone. Um, raising capital, like I said, all that. Building out our sales team has been a huge milestone. Um, you know, but for me, it's, it's really, you know, something great happens high five and what's the next thing yeah. we got to get done. So what are you working on now? What's next for the marketing component? So right now I am, um, actually, well this week, in fact, I'm designing a lot of new packaging, um, for, uh, an upscale copy retailer. Um, and so doing specific packaging for them. Um, I'm not going to press you on that. Name. I'm not yeah. going to press you on the name of that. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you can speculate that one out. Right. Um, and so uh, a, a lot of packaging design and figuring out channel strategy um, going to the new channels in 2017 is uh, the big focus. Yeah. Yeah. So Nick, I've, I always ask this Inspired Insider um, two questions. And I'm going to ask them, but first, let's tell people where to go. I mean, they can obviously go to, uh, is it Safeway, Whole Foods, certain targets, um, barnana.com. It's B A R N A N A dot com. Where else can they go? Yeah, so barnana.com is definitely the best spot to go. Um, we're also in Sprouts, Whole Foods, Wegmans. Uh, we're in most of the natural organic retailers nationwide. Um, and of course, you know, shout out to us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, your social media platform of choice, um, you know, with thoughts, feedback, um, requests, questions. Uh, we love interacting with people in general. So, What's the most common frequency people purchase for uh, recurring shipment? Because it was 15 days, 30 days, and 60 day option, right? Yeah, 30 days is, 30 uh, days. is typical, yeah. So I always ask this, Nick. Um, What's been the lowest moment and how you push through the hard time? Um, and then the highest or proudest moment so far. What's been the lowest for you? The lowest point for me, um, man, there's two of them that come to mind. Uh, definitely when we were first starting the business. Uh, you know, I was still in college. I maxed out all my credit cards. Uh, defaulted on my student loans to start the company. Um, not something that I wanted to do, but just something that what were had you to spending happen. the money on at the time? Like, what were you paying for in the credit card? Um, well, my education for one, so I yeah. did finance some of my education through credit cards, and then also just living expenses. Uh, we didn't have uh, any income to begin with starting Barnana. We didn't raise capital right off the bat. It took us, you know, a few mm. months. Um, so definitely, uh, ruining your credit's not fun. Getting those calls, um, that was definitely a low point. Uh, although all the while having the optimism that everything yeah. would work out and it would yeah. be all for the better. I mean, but at the time you just did what you had to do, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I just believed that, that it would work out and I knew that, uh, I knew that I could make it happen. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't too concerned about it. Um, but it did drag on me a little bit. Um, and then I think probably the only thing that surpasses that as the lowest moment is when my dad passed away mm -hmm. about a year into the business mm. when we were still Sorry married. to hear that, man. Yeah, yeah. This is not something I talk about a lot, right? But um, if you're asking me honestly, that that's definitely yeah. the lowest point for sure. You know, because that's the reality, Nick. Yeah. You know, like when you're running a business, it's not like you're, you're operating in a bubble, right? Yeah. You're operating and you have to handle all the personal stuff too. 
exactly you know, right. and then pushing through that, that's just really tough, you know, because yeah. then how do you focus on a business or anything for that matter if that stuff happens in your life, you know? Yeah, I mean, you have to have your head on just so tight, man. Um, that can really wreck people, you know, especially my dad was the guy that raised me. He's my best friend, the whole thing. Right. Um, you know, it was an accident. It was a plan thing. So, you know, you That's really horrible. have to have some mental fortitude to just put your head uh, to the grindstone and, and make sure that you're taking care of all the employees and investors and everything else that you've built um, and not let anything fall through the cracks. When you think of your dad... What story do you think of? <laughs> what story do I think of? Yeah. Yeah, I think that probably the story that I think of the most is one of the last times that I saw him. Um, I gave him a new Bardana shirt, and he was just so stoked. Mm. Uh, and again, you know, he passed away when we were one year into the business, so we hadn't really built anything giant at that point. Mm. Uh, but you see the look on his face, man. He was he was excited. So yeah. that's definitely the one that comes to he mind. Knew. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. I appreciate that. That's yeah, it's really hard. Um, so on the flip side, what's been some of the proudest moments for you personally? I think probably one of the proudest moments, um, it was actually sort of a succession of, of proud moments. Um, a few of our employees have had kids now, and I think that you know, when you're running a business and you have employees and you know you need to take care of them and their families and everything else, um, being able to provide them with um, the income and the benefits and everything necessary to, to raise yeah. a newborn baby that's uh, amazing. is something pretty special. So yeah. you know, I've experienced that a couple times now. Um, I think that's probably one of the high points. Barnana babies. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. What about from the business standpoint? Um, What's been the most – I mean, you've gotten to know, have a lot of success with different distribution channels. What's been personally for you – been a huge win? I think the biggest win for us is that we've grown with velocity instead of sort of the shotgun blast, low velocity, high footprint strategy. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in the food industry, you can grow one of two ways. So you can either grow through velocity um, or you can grow through just having a ton of retailers that you sell in. Um, and so for us, knowing that there's repeat purchase and people actually really do love the product and keep going back and repurchasing it on a macro level in mass um, is definitely one of the most rewarding things for me. Um, I think that seeing that velocity means that the business is growing in the right way, in a sustainable way, in a way that brands grow that last, um, that aren't just kind of a flash in the pan. Yeah. That's something I'm really proud of. Yeah. Nick, this has been amazing. How can people best support you? Is it better for them if they're interested to get it on your site? Is it better to get it in retail? What What's best? Yeah, I think um, the best way is, is whatever's most convenient for you. You know, uh, yeah. Obviously, at Barnana.com, uh, we control all the experience. Um, you know, Any issues that anybody ever has, you can always reach out to us in customer service. Um, you know, Going in, supporting the retailers is great too, Whole Foods, et cetera. Uh, really, really, any support is, is welcome support, and um, we just hope that we're doing something that uh, everybody else can love. So Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Check out barnana.com. Nick, it's been amazing. I appreciate it. Likewise, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you.